In this lesson, we're going to talk about the NFS implementation on our NetApp data on tap systems. First thing to tell you is that each of the different NAS and SAN protocols are licensed separately. So if you want to use NFS, SAFES, Fiber Channel, iSCSI, whichever protocol you want to use, make sure that you have the license installed on the system. If you don't have the license installed, then you won't be able to use it. And when you create the SVM in System Manager, you're going to see that you don't have the option there to enable the protocol if you don't have it licensed already. NFS and SIPs are configured on a per SVM basis and NFS and SIFs are configured independently of each other. They can both be enabled on the same SVM. So you could have one SVM with both NFS and SIFs enabled on it, or you could have an SVM for NFS and you could have a different SVM for SIFs. You could also have two different SIFs SVMs and have two different settings for each SVM. Each SVM operates as a separate system and it shows up as a separate storage system to your clients. Okay, let's talk about our NFS versions. NFS was invented by Sun Microsystems, they're a very popular manufacturer of Unix-based systems. It's a standard NAS protocol for our Unix-based clients, which includes Linux clients. It can also be accessed by VMware, ESXi, it's a popular choice for that, Windows and Mac clients. So it was originally designed for Unix, but it can be accessed by other operating systems as well. NFS version 1 was only used for internal testing by Sun, so NFS version 1 was never released in the wild. NFS version 2 was standardized in 1989, so a long time ago. It's a stateless protocol that supports only 32-bit files with a maximum file size of 2 gigabytes. So that was a fairly important limitation on there. NFS version 2 not supported by NetApp. NFS version 3 was standardized in 1995, so that's still been around for a long time as well. It's also a stateless protocol. It's got performance enhancements over NFS version 2, and it supports TCP and 64-bit files. NFS version 2 only supported UDP. Files can be up to 16 terabytes on NetApp data on tap systems. So because it supports 64-bit files now, we don't have that 2 gigabyte file limitation. Our files can be a lot larger. It supports local user ID and group ID to authenticate users, and it supports Kerberos authentication as well. And it's been around for a long time, but it still retains widespread support in production systems, and it's enabled by default on our NetApp data on tap systems. NFS version 4 was standardized in 2003. It's a stateful protocol, so version 2 and version 3 are stateless, version 4 is stateful. It has the same file size capability as NFS version 3, so again it supports the larger file sizes, and it has security enhancements over version 3, including support for Windows style ACLs rather than just the native Unix permissions, and end-to-end -end security. It's disabled by default on NetApp. NFS version 4.1 is a stateful protocol as NFS v4 is and it extends NFS version 4 by adding sessions, directory delegations and parallel NFS, PNFS, to provide scalability and performance improvements on clustered storage systems. We'll be talking a bit more about PNFS later in this lesson. NFS version 4.1 has no dependencies on version 4 and it's considered a separate protocol. Like version 4, version 4.1 is also disabled by default on NetApp. So the only version that is enabled by default when you turn NFS on is version 3.
And this ties in with what I was saying before about there still being a lot of widespread support for version 3. Next thing to talk about is NFS referrals. Referrals came out in version 4. They're supported in version 4 and version 4.1. If a node receives an NFS request for data on a volume on another node, it will refer the client to use a LIF on the node which hosts the volume. So this is an enhancement for our cluster-based systems. So with data on tap, we're running it in cluster mode. We've got multiple nodes in the cluster. If a client hits a logical interface, so an IP address, which is on a physical interface on a node, which is not the same node as where the volume is, then the node will refer the client to use a different logical interface on the node that does have the volume. That saves us having to send traffic between nodes going over the cluster interconnect. Support for NFS referrals is not uniformly available on all NFS version 4 clients. If the feature is enabled and a client that does not support it receives a referral from the server, the client cannot access the volume and it will experience a failure. So don't enable referrals unless all your clients support it or it's going to break your file access. Our commands to control NFS referrals, whether it's enabled or not, we say SVM NFS modify SVM and in the name of our SVM, V4 FSID change enabled, the first command, and then SVM NFS modify SVM, the name of our SVM, version 4.1 referrals enabled or disabled. So this can be enabled or disabled on a per SVM basis. Similar to referrals, PNFS, Parallel NFS, which came out in version 4.1, can also direct a client to use a LIF on the local node that houses the volume. If an administrator moves a volume to another node, PNFS will redirect the client with no need to remount. With NFS referrals, if the volume moves, the client is not updated until it unmounts and remounts the file system. So what we're talking about here, and this is not something that's going to be happening very regularly, but say an administrator moves a volume from one aggregate to a different aggregate. Maybe the aggregate it was on was running out of room, or maybe we want to move it to disks that have got better or worse performance. Well, if we use NFS referrals, when the client first connect, it will be referred to use a local LIF. But if the volume then moves to a different node, the client will not be updated. It will then be using a LIF that is not on the local node. But with PNFS, it will also tell a client which node to use when it initially connects, but it can also update the client if the volume moves after that. NFS referrals and PNFS are mutually exclusive. You can only enable one or the other on an SVM. PNFS is enabled by default if NFS version 4.1 is enabled. So NFS version 4.1 is disabled by default, but if you turn on NFS version 4.1, then PNFS will also be turned on with it by default. The command at the command line, SVM NFS modify your SVM version 4.1, PNFS enabled or disabled. As well as our referrals and PNFS, another feature that is supported in NFS version 4 and 4.1 is support for Windows-style NFS ACLs in addition to the standard Unix permissions. So this gives us a lot more flexibility on how we configure our permissions for our users and groups. ACLs are disabled by default. To turn them on at the command line, SVM NFS modify your SVM, then version 4.1 ACL enabled or disabled. Okay, on to the next topic, which is name services. Clients on your end hosts must be properly authenticated before they can access data on the NetApp system. When an NFS client connects, the Unix credentials for the user can be checked against different name services. 
we can check their credentials against local user accounts where we specify type file or against an NIS domain and or against LDAP domains. At least one name service must be configured to successfully authenticate the user. Each SVM acts as a separate storage system, as you know, and can use different settings. Kerberos is supported for the authentication, and if you're using NIS, LDAP, or Kerberos, that requires an external server. Even though the underlying operating system that Data ONTAP runs on top of is Unix-based, the Data ONTAP system cannot act as an NIS, LDAP, or Kerberos server itself. So for those services, you have to configure an external server. You can specify multiple name services and the order in which data on tap searches them. So we don't have to choose between file NIS and LDAP. We could, for example, say check LDAP first. And then if LDAP does not give us a result or it's not available, we can fall back to using local file type. SVM services name service NS switch is the command that we would use if we wanted to configure this at the command line. We can also configure it in the GUI as well. That provides the same functionality as the slash etsy slash NS switch dot conf command on a Unix system. And if you look at the table on the slide here, it should be very familiar to you if you are used to working on Unix based systems. So first database password is used for user information. Our options there, we can use files, the local file, NIX or LDAP. For group, that's our user group information. Again, we can use files, NIS or LDAP. The hosts database converts host names to IP addresses. For that, we can use files or DNS. Netgroup is where we can look up netgroup information. We can use files, NIS, or LDAP for that. And finally, name map, that is used in multi-protocol name mappings. I'm gonna be talking about multi-protocol in a later lesson in this section. For now, what it's used for is Windows users getting access to files and folders that have got Unix style permissions and vice versa, Unix users getting access to files and folders with NTFS style permissions. I'll cover that in detail in a lesson coming up pretty shortly. For name map, we can use files or LDAP. For our user authentication, if you use local Unix accounts, which is type file, then the SVM trusts the end host to authenticate the client, meaning it will accept the UID that the client sends and it will trust that the client has authenticated that user. If the client matches an export policy rule on our SVM and sends a UID, which has permissions in the SVM, then they can access the directories and files. This is obviously a big security risk because it's very easy for somebody on a client to send whatever UID they want. So rather than using local Unix accounts, it's preferred to use LDAP with Kerberos authentication. If you do use Kerberos authentication, that is configured at the logical interface level.